Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. And we thank Brad and Michael for leading in worship and praying us in. And so we'll just begin this morning. We will say, Holy Spirit, we do ask that you be our rabbi today. We know that you are. And we do thank you so much that you're our constant encourager. There's never a moment, Holy Spirit, when you're not encouraging us. And any word, any thought that is the opposite is not from you. So we thank you for that today in Christ's name. Well, be encouraged today. And we're going to look at something. This is a theme that we've discussed in the past. We've talked about the suddenlies of God, but we've looked at it really more in a rhema, excuse me, in a logos way. A logos word is an expression. It's a truth. Uh, it's an idea about something, uh, a revelation about something. But there's also a rhema word in New Testament. Those two words appear in rhema has to do with a command or something that's more immediate. And an example of that was when Peter was fishing and didn't catch anything in Yeshua. Jesus had asked about that, and he said, hey, we, we fished all night. We didn't catch anything. But he said, nonetheless, at your rhema, we will try again. And so Peter was saying, at your command, at your immediate word, uh, we will act upon that. And so there is that difference. And so today... And the Lord is really shifting us to look at this more in a rhema word, more of a command, more of an immediate word. So let's just do that. Let's unpack what God is saying to us. Well, there we go. There are two biblical words that are translated as suddenly. The Hebrew in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, is pithom. And it means suddenly, straightway, or surprisingly. In the New Testament, we see the Greek word exiphnes, and it means of a sudden or unexpectedly. And the Hebrew and Greek words both carry the idea of something happening abruptly and surprisingly and unexpectedly. We see this in Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now remember, God is the great... I am. We see that in Exodus 3, 14. And this means that he is self-existent and that he is existence itself. I am. Thus, he's not bound or limited by time or space. He speaks and it is because he is. So the understanding that we have here is because God is not limited or bound by time or space, we cannot look at our circumstances through natural eyes and expect to see it from his perspective. If we do, that's going to wear us down. And I think all of us can relate to that. I know I can. Uh, being a human being, having natural eyes and natural ears, having human emotions, and being in something for an extended period of time does wear us down. And Christ understands that. He lived it. He knows exactly what it feels like to be a human being. He knows what it feels like to walk in time, but nonetheless, he is the son of God. He's God himself, and he did not choose to look at things through natural eyes. Isaiah 11 tells us that. He always sought to see things from his father's perspective by Holy Spirit. And so the amount of time, the duration that something is going on or something that, or that you're experiencing something does not determine God's ability to do something about it. All he has to do is speak a word and everything changes. Creation came into existence suddenly simply because God began to speak it. Well, they're long-term suddenlies. And the Hebrew word for wait, as we've seen before, is the word chava. And it means to wait, to look for, to hope, to expect. And it means to bind together by twisting and the pictures of being wrapped around that for which one is waiting to the point of being completely bound to it and one with it. See, God may wait many years in order to prepare the ones he's chosen 
to steward his suddenlies to cause them to be wrapped around him and his purpose. You know, I've shared it with you before, but the Hebrew language is a picture language. And the illustration that really helps me a lot uh, is this. And this is Chava in Hebrew. This is the picture. And you have two things that are being wrapped around one another. Now, if this blue cord is the Lord and the red cord is you, uh, and you're asking the Lord for something, you're seeking him, and you're coming to him in prayer. You say, Abba, Father, in Christ's name, in your spirit, Lord, I, I ask for this thing. And so you, you connect yourself to him in prayer through that. It doesn't happen immediately. Lord, I, I, I seek your will in this. I, I seek your desire, your purposes in this. Still doesn't happen. Lord, I continue to seek you. I worship you. I praise you day by day moment by moment. You're continuing to pray. You're continuing to remain connected to him. But you see what's happening? You're waiting on God's will to be accomplished, but you're being wrapped around him and he's being wrapped around you. You're becoming one with God. That's what Kava is. That's what it does in our lives. That's one of the reasons why Abba waits Kava to answer prayers in our lives, because it's more important that you be united with him than it is for something just to happen. So his desire is that we become one with him. Remember, Christ is one with God, and his desire is that we would become one with him once again. And so Abba will allow things into our lives personally and collectively that cause us to seek him, to worship him, to praise him more deeply. But with every prayer, with every focus upon him, with every desire we have for him, we become more and more wrapped around him and he around us and in us, and we become one with him. And when the right moment comes, then we are in the center of his person and his will, and we're able to receive that which he desires to do in our lives. So that really has helped me over the years. I have this mental picture of these two cords being wrapped around one another. I hope it does the same for you. In the fullness of time, and they, and of course that's re referencing Abram, he's not yet Abraham in this moment, these are Abram's descendants, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That's Genesis 15, 16. Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. So those loyal to Christ must remember that the will of God cannot be separated from his timing for it. We are praying for the will of God, but we have to remember that he cannot and will not separate his will from the timing for it. That kairos time, the Greek word there, there's a, there's a specific moment, there's a specific time when everything is made right. You know, in this Genesis passage, we see he's saying that the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And the Lord allows, because we are people of choice, God graces us to make choices. And we choose to be obedient, we choose to rebel. And God is saying, the Amorites, uh, I am merciful, and I am waiting. I'm giving them opportunity. Uh, I know how long it takes, and I know when the right time is. Their iniquity is yet not yet complete. I'm still allowing these choices to be made. There will be a point in time when enough will be enough. And at that moment, then I'm going to do something in and through your descendants. Well, the same thing is true. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. We were needing salvation the very moment that Adam and Eve chose to rebel. That's when death entered the world. That's when our relationship with God was broken. So mankind, humanity, needed salvation from that moment forward. But when the time had fully come, that's when God sent his salvation in his son, Yeshua, in Jesus. You know, there were three major things that had come to fruition in the time of Christ. Uh, three major streams, if you will. Uh, the Greco world, the Roman world, and the Hebrew world, all had reached their zenith. Think about it. The, the Greek people had taken human thought, human philosophy to its zenith, to its highest level. Uh, the, in, the intellect of the Greeks was extreme. It was very high from a man's standpoint. And their academic system, their categories, we still use them today. 
in, in the modern West. We have not surpassed the, the philosophies, the, the human categories of the Greeks. They had taken human, human intellect to its height. And we haven't surpassed that. We have more information than they had, more gained knowledge, but we're not more intellectual. We're not more intelligent today. And we're still operating under uh, intellectual categories that they developed. So the Greeks had taken human thought to its height. Well, think about the Romans during the time of Christ. They had taken government and conquest and military superiority to its height. The Roman people, the Roman government, effectively controlled uh, the known civilized world at that time. And they were very organized uh, with a highway system, uh, system of government. Uh, it was taken to its height. So the Roman world at that time, the Roman people had taken human government, uh, military authority, uh, engineering, all those things, travel uh, had been taken to its height. Well, think about the Hebrew people during the time of Christ. They had also taken religion as far as you can take it, as far as it can take you. Uh, they had the feasts, the festivals, they had all those things. They were practicing it uh, ad nauseum, really. And so these three streams had come together when the time had fully come, when the Greeks had taken human thought as far as it can really go. Again, you can get more information, but the, the level of their thought has not been surpassed. The Romans had taken government and military conquest to its height, and the Jews had taken religion to its height, and all three of those were proven empty. They were not enough. But the Lord had to allow all those things to come to their fullness when the time had fully come. Then Christ entered the world because Christ shows up and he speaks to God's government is greater than man's government. God's government is greater than the Roman government. God's thought processes are greater than the Greeks. And God is not a God of religion. You, the Jews, the audience to whom he's speaking primarily, are saying, you have all these religious practices and yet you're still empty. And if you're honest, you know that. You know there's something missing. And it's something that the law, the Torah cannot give you. The practices, the sacrifices cannot do for you. So all of these things, the fullness of time had come. Now Christ enters the world and says to the Greeks, I'm the answer you're looking for. To the Romans, I'm the answer you're looking for. To the Jews, I'm the answer you're looking for. So the Lord waits until the time is right for him to move. Well, there's sudden release. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly, and that word is roots, which means to run, to dart, they quickly brought him out of the pit, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh, Genesis 41, 14. Now, God had used 13 years of rejection, slavery, and prison to prepare Joseph for his suddenly. The Lord wanted him to be ready to humbly and wisely handle the promotion to great leadership. And we see Psalm 105, 17, 22 recounting this, how the Lord knew that there would be uh, a famine in the land. He sent Joseph ahead of them, sold as a slave, and the word of the Lord tested him and prepared him and honed him for leadership. Now, could ha Abba have just simply placed Joseph in leadership? Yeah, he simply could have done that, but Joseph wasn't ready. There was something that had to happen in him, and that chavah, that waiting on God in slavery and prison, was causing Joseph to be wrapped around God's heart and mind every day. He's more wrapped around, more wrapped around, more wrapped around. He's becoming more and more like God's heart and mind and character because to have the kind of authority Joseph was going to be given, he was literally the second most powerful human being on earth at that time. He became prime minister over Egypt. Egypt was the superpower of the world, and Pharaoh was the ruler of, e of Egypt. So Pharaoh was the single most powerful man on earth talking about in civil government. And Joseph became second in command. He was second only to him. That's a massive amount of authority. And that could go to your head in a hurry. You could mess it up easily. And the Lord didn't want that to happen. He wanted to have a man of integrity and a man of grace, a man of wisdom to take that place. And so it took time for Abba to get Joseph to a place where he could steward, where he could handle that mantle well. And that's what he was doing in him. And that's what he's doing in you. The thing you're waiting on, he is continuing to work 
in you, in me, in us, he, he, because he wants to bless you with that. He wants to fulfill that desire that he's placed in your heart. He wants his will done more than you do, more than we do. He wants to bless more than we want to be blessed, honestly. But he's waiting for the fullness of time. He's waiting for the right moment. And he can do it suddenly. And so it, it only takes a moment. It just takes a word. God said, and it was. God says now, and it is. He can open that door. You know, for Joseph, you think about it, 15 minutes before that door opened, that jail cell opened, everything looked like it had the year before and the year before that. 10 minutes, five minutes before the door opened, it all looked the same. But all of a sudden, the door opened and everything changed. And so the Holy Spirit would have you know that God can change your circumstance, our circumstance in an instant, in a moment. That's not an issue for him. That's not a problem. That's not a challenge. Nothing's impossible. But just know that if there's a delay, it's purposeful because he wants to make sure that when he does that thing in an instant, you're ready to receive it. There can be a sudden release in a sudden mantle in 2 Kings 2, 11 and 13. And they still went on and talked, and behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And of course, this is the context of the relationship uh, between Elijah and Elisha. Elisha had been chosen to be Elijah's successor. Abba had told Elijah that, go mantle, go put your tallit, go put your cloak on Elisha. He's working out in the field. And Elisha in that moment knew that that was a sign that one day it was God's will for him to steward that mantle. But it was probably 10 to 13 years. We don't, we don't know exactly, uh, but roughly 10 to 13 years of service to prepare Elisha to carry Elijah's mantle, spiritual leadership. So while from the moment that the sign was placed on him, this is God's will for your life. If you say yes, and you continue to walk in this daily, one day you will steward this mantle also. But it took roughly 10 to 13 years. But here's the thing. It happened in a moment. Because there was a day, there was a moment when Abba came for Elijah in a whirlwind, quite a spectacle to say the least. But he takes Elijah and he says, I'm done with my purpose is through you personally now, Elijah, on earth, and I'm taking you to be with me. And so as he does, that mantle, that cloak, that tallit falls to the ground, and Elijah leaves it behind, and it's, it's right there on the ground in front of Elisha. And that happened just like that. So mantles can come to you in a moment, in an instant. So the duration of time that God prepares you for that does not diminish the reality of it, the power of it, the truth of it, the promise of it in any way. It can come just like that. There's sudden plot twists. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he? Who has dared to do this? And Esther said, a foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and, and the queen. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, Esther 7, 5 through 6, and also verse 10. So God hid and prepared Hadassah, Esther, for many years to ready her for one sudden moment that would protect an entire nation. God has not changed. He has not stepped down from his throne. His promises are not broken. His love for us is not diminished in any way. God always hides his Hadassahs, his Esthers, and puts them in place. And at the right time, the right moment, God moves and he changes everything. He can save a nation in an instant. Everybody catch that? He can save an entire nation in an instant. Even though there are wicked plots of the enemy to destroy God's people, to destroy what's good and what's right, even though there are lies and there are schemes and they seem to be working, God can and will save a nation in an instant. Sudden provision. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had provided for the people for the thing, which was the restoration of worship in the temple. It came about suddenly 
Second Chronicles 29, 36. So the fruit of the obedience of Hezekiah quickly emerged after 16 dark years of sinful reign by his father Ahaz. And we see that in, in 28, 1. So there was a quick turnaround. And there was sudden provision for what needed to be done. Sudden attack. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the throng of evildoers. But God shoots his arrow at them, and they are wounded suddenly. Psalm 64, 2 and 7. So David knew and believed that God is always perfectly aware of the plots of evil. There's nothing going on right now that God is not aware of. There's nothing happening right now that Abba didn't know about before he began to speak this world into being. He already saw this day. He already knew it. So David knew that, and he believed that, and he knew that God is perfectly aware of the plots of evil, and that he's always in the process of allowing the tension to build around his chosen arrows to increase the force and the accuracy of his counterattack. You know, I've shared with you before the analogy and the understanding of uh, how an arrow works, how it's effective. And, you know, to have an arrow, and what's interesting about arrows and bows and arrows is they really haven't changed over the centuries. I mean, the bows are made out of uh, different composition, and there's a little more technology and those kinds of things and a little different technology in making an arrow. But the principle is exactly the same as it has always been. And you are that arrow of the Lord, and we see that in Scripture. And so the Lord first, anyone who's making an arrow, you, you have to deal with the arrow first. You have to uh, find the right tree, the right kind of wood. And, of course, I'm thinking in ancient terms. And uh, cut that off, and then you begin to hone it and shape it. Uh, you have to make a point that's very sharp. You have to prepare that. Uh, you you're want to make sure that the balance of the arrow is, is equal, that it's right, uh, that it's straight. And there's a process to that. But once that arrow is made ready, uh, then something has to happen around it for it to be effective. Now, the arrow by itself is not a threat to an enemy. Uh, it's, it's prepared, but something else has to happen. Another thing is that uh, with human strength, uh, I'm not going to hurt anybody in this room if I aim this arrow at you and just throw it at you. Uh, it might smart a little bit if it hits you in the face, but that's really all that's going to happen. Something else has to happen for this arrow to be effective and powerful. Tension has to be placed around it. So it's placed in a bow, but that then tension has to occur, and so the arrow begins to be pulled backward by the marksman, and that's God. Now, you have a promise in your life. You have something God has said, and you're ready to go. You're that arrow. You're like, okay, Lord, let's do this thing. Well, here's the deal. Usually, everything in your life regarding that is going to go look in the other direction. It's it, you, God gives you something he wants you to do, and all of a sudden it gets harder, and it looks like, well, Lord, I thought you told me this, but it looks like it's going in the opposite direction. Well, what's happening? Tension is building around that circumstance. And the more it goes in the opposite direction, the more tension grows around you, the arrow. And the more it goes, the more tension. Well, the more tension that's being placed around this arrow, the more force that's being placed around it. And at the right moment, all the God has to do, all the marksman has to do is release his fingers. And the arrow has hit its mark and the enemy has been wiped out. There's tension building in our nation right now in the spirit realm. Now, we believe for good things. We know God wants good things for his people. That has not changed. But we look around us and we go, uh, this ain't it. <laughs> hmm. And all of us feel the tension spiritually. And we're going, what is happening? Lord, this seems to be the opposite of what we're believing. Yes, it is, seemingly. There's tension building. There's tension building. But the arrow of the Lord is being prepared, and it only takes a moment, and suddenly, whoop, the enemy is brought down, and everything changes. So don't forget that God is a God of sudden attacks, and he's always accurate. Sudden fulfillment 
the former things I declared of old, they went out from my mouth and I announced them. Then suddenly I did them and they came to pass, Isaiah 48, 3. So Isaiah prophesied things God would do in the future to help prepare his people for them and to ensure, help ensure that God alone would receive the credit. Though many years ahead, they would happen suddenly. So Isaiah is speaking things. He's, he's putting that word out there, that logos word out there. But there's a rhema moment when it's going to be fulfilled. But the Lord puts his word out there to get it into the hearts and minds of his people to cause us to think over that, pray over that, and he's preparing us for it. But it happens suddenly. When he gets ready to move, he just speaks. He just does it, and it is. And there's sudden fulfillment of it sudden arrival behold i send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight behold he is coming says the lord of hosts malachi 3 1 so though john the baptist clearly pointed to yeshua as messiah most at god's temple were not ready for him now it was promised that a messenger would come and say and suddenly he's here and in that regard christ did come upon them here he is he just emerged it had been centuries in the making, but it happened in a moment. And for those who had hearts to receive and listen and hear, they saw Christ for who he was, and they were blessed by that. The ones who aren't prepared or did their own thing or wanted their own religion, they missed him completely. But there's a sudden arrival, and God hasn't changed. And there are things that will happen suddenly. I'm not a prophet, but I am a son of God. You're a son or a daughter of God if you have faith in Christ. And the Lord does speak to us. You don't have to be a prophet to have him speak to you. He speaks to you daily. He's guiding you. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the truth. And I know that Christ is moving. And there is a rhema word. There are suddenlies. We're in God's season of suddenly. So don't allow the duration. Don't allow the battle. Don't become fatigued and think that that determines what God can or will do. That's humanity. That's human emotion. That's human thought. That's looking at things through natural eyes and your natural ears, which is the exact opposite of what Yeshua did. He always saw with the eyes of God. He didn't make decisions based on his natural eyes or his natural ears. So the, the lies that are being told around you daily, the, the discouragement, the defeat, the darkness, the enemy is real, the plot is real, the scheme is real, the scheme and the plot is to destroy our nation, it is to destroy God's people, There's no question about that, that's not news, <laughs> it's, and it's not new, it's been that way since the garden, so we shouldn't be shocked by that, we shouldn't be amazed by that. But the duration of this doesn't mean that God has forgotten us or that his power has been diminished in any way. There will be a sudden arrival. What God begins to do will happen suddenly. And Holy Spirit is wanting you to be encouraged by that. That's not to predict what God's going to do. It's not going to say how he's going to do it, when he's going to do it. I don't know those things. I just know that he's going to do it because he is the same God. He does love you. He loves me. He loves us. He wants his will done more than we do. He will be glorified. He will not allow the enemy to be exalted in this earth. The earth belongs to Yeshua, Psalm 2, and he's taking it all back, and nothing has changed today. And sudden praise emerges from that, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased, Luke 2, 13 through 14. So the praise of God is constant in the heavenly realm. Nothing changes in, in God's realm, in the heavenly realm, where his manifest presence is. Constant 24-7, 365, if you have to put human terms on it, worship. In Jesus Christ, that curtain is opened suddenly in the natural realm, and he is glorified in the earth. At any given moment, all Abba has to do is open the veil, if you will. And the, the constant praise and glory of God that is known, that is truth, that is constant in the heavenly realm is then released into the earthly realm. And it happens just that fast. You can ask the shepherds about that. Look like an average night of work. They're out in the fields in the springtime. That's when baby lambs are born. They're only born in the spring. So that's why we can know Christ was born in the spring. Um, that's what they're out there in the field doing is they're protecting the mothers. They're helping them birth the lambs. And all of a sudden, everything changed, and the veil was opened, and the heavenly host 
were praising God and they saw what it really looks like. And needless to say, they were never the same. And there's a sudden call, Mark 1, 16 through 17, passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. That's why they were casting. I've always thought that was funny. You know, they were casting a net in the sea because they were fishermen. That's why they were doing that. that makes sense. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men, fishers of people. So the brothers had already met and had conversed with Yeshua, and they had become familiar with him. And we see that in John 1, 35 through 42. It's not that they're out doing their thing, and this unknown rabbi just shows up. They've never seen him before. They've never heard of him. And he says, come follow me. And they're like, I don't know who he is, but sure, we'll leave our business and our families and our way of life and go follow a guy we've never heard of, and we have no idea who he is or what he's. No, they already had met him. They had already been listening to him teach. And so... There was a moment, however, when his call to them came suddenly. And see, that's where we are. You know, you're, you're listening to him teach in your daily prayers and your Bible study and you're walking with him. You already know Yeshua. That's not news to you. you. You have a relationship with him. And in that, he's ministering to you and revealing himself to you in your daily life. And in many ways, things look pretty much the same as they did last week or, you know, in your job, in your role, in your family. Those things seem pretty common, pretty regular. There's always a moment, though, for those who desire to go on with God when the Lord is going to come into your life and he's going to say something to you that's going to shift everything. There's a sudden call that comes, and that's when you need to be ready. You need to be available to say, okay, Lord, let's do that thing today. It's a sudden call, and it requires a sudden response, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately, there's the word euthus, and it means to make straight immediately or to govern. So sudden calls demand immediate responses. But those who say yes make straight paths to Christ, and they begin to govern over their circumstances. So as you're walking with Yeshua on a daily basis, and you're just loving him back, and you're listening to him, and you're Again, you're being wrapped around him. You're becoming more one with him, more like him. Uh, there comes a moment, and he knows when that is by the wisdom of his heart and mind, when he says, okay, now let's go do that next thing. And when you say yes to him, that makes a straight path, that sudden thing, and you begin to govern over that circumstance. Let's go all the way back to Genesis and Joseph's story again. He was prepared for years, but there was a suddenly when God came to him. It was in natural means through the guards opening the door and, and uh, him being brought physically before Pharaoh. But it happened immediately, and he began to govern immediately. And he became second in command over Egypt. It happened that quickly. And so it is for us. Whatever circumstance in, in that dire need that's around you personally and your family, in your sphere of influence in our nation, uh, it only takes a moment. You just say yes to the Lord. He puts you in the right place, the right situation. And it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to move you or remove you from a particular location. It may be that you're going to rule and reign in that moment, in that place. But it could be that he may relocate you. That, that's up to him. But the key to it is, is when that moment comes, that you just simply say yes to him and trust him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. And that relationship you have with him, he's the same Jesus who loved you when you were a little girl or a little boy. He's the same one. So you don't have to fear that. You can say, hey, Lord, you're not going to change. I trusted you when I was little. I trusted you last week, and I can trust you now. Our circumstances change, but you haven't. So I'm just going to keep my eyes on you. We're going to keep walking this thing out together. And because you have prepared me and now you've mantled me, then I'm going to govern in you, and you're going to change this circumstance for the good. And there's sudden empowerment in that. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, Acts 2.2. 2. So God has the ability to empower his people suddenly in an instant. He can give you something in a moment that you did never had in your life. It can happen just like that. 
the crux of the matter then is openness and readiness and obedience on the part of his people. That's all that's necessary. That's the thing God can't do for you. He can't make you obedient. He can't make you loyal. He's not going to force you to say yes. That's up to you. But what he can do in an instant is give you a wisdom you've never had before, an authority you've never had before, a gifting you've never had before, a mantle you've never had before. He can do that in a moment. You just have to be ready and you have to say yes. In sudden encounters, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And of course, this is the context of, at this time, Saul, who became known as Paul, was zealous about going on his way. As he went on his way, Saul was doing his thing. He was doing it his way. He had his agenda, and it wasn't good. We know that. As he was going on his way to persecute the followers of Christ, Christ is the way, John 14, 6. So it was inevitable that the two ways would collide. And it happened suddenly, and the same remains true today. Because Paul was going his way against Christ, and Christ is always going his way because he is the way. It was inevitable that those two ways were going to collide because Paul was, Saul at that time, was persecuting Christ's people. Well, he's coming at Christ. If you're coming against Christ's people, you're coming against him. So it was inevitable that Saul was going to come colliding with Yeshua himself. And that was a sudden encounter, a sudden moment, and it changed everything for Paul. Paul had a decision to make, didn't he? He could have remained rebellious. He, he could have continued to despise Christ and his people, and things would have been entirely different for him. But he was humbled by this, and he was broken by this. He was literally blinded for a time, and then Christ restored his sight. And then he became the Paul that we know and love and respect in Christ. It was a sudden encounter. And there's sudden freedom. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Acts 16, 25 through 26. So faithfulness through obedience and worship leads to sudden breakthroughs, sudden freedom. Remember, the context of this is Paul and Silas had been uh, captured. They had been beaten. They had been put in stocks. Uh, they were in the bowels, the deepest part of the prison. It, it wasn't a good situation, but their hearts were totally free in Christ. And so they were worshiping the Lord together, and they were forming a mercy seat there, this goes all the way back to the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness with the God said, I will meet you there on the mercy seat. And the image there is of two worshipers, two angelic beings kneeling and facing one another with their wings spread. They're separate, but they're one. And God is their focus. And that's where the presence of God would meet with Moses. And so Paul and Silas were fulfilling that. They were forming a mercy seat because these two worshipers were united and they were one in their focus on God and they invited the presence of God into that prison. And so there was an earthquake, a physical earthquake. It doesn't have to be a physical earthquake. It could be a spiritual one in a circumstance. So when you have two worshipers who are united and they're praising God, they're in that, they're, they're forming a place for God's Shekinah glory to go out. And that's exactly what happened there. And not only were Paul and Silas, were their bonds loosed, physical bonds, their spiritual bonds had already been loosed, but their physical bonds were loosed. Well, that happened for everybody else in the prison as well. Everybody was blessed. Everybody was set free physically, but we also see that spiritual freedom came to them. And even the jailer became free in Jesus Christ, that sudden freedom. So the bondage that the enemy is placing on this nation and on this world, it can change in a moment. How does it change? It changes by God's people being united in worship and praise and prayer. That cannot change today. It must not change today because God has not changed today. And as we humble ourselves before him and we're, we're united in prayer and praise and worship and focus, that forms the mercy seat that invites the presence of God to come into the circumstance. And it doesn't just bless the worshipers. It blesses those around the worshipers as well because they're given the opportunity to know who God is and become free, and it can happen suddenly. Abba, we thank you so much for your living word to us today. 
Holy Spirit, if we're hearing this and we're not encouraged, we're not listening to you. We're still listening to the voice of the world. So, Father, I pray in Christ's name that that would be broken today. Lord, there's a heaviness in the hearts of your people, and you know that. But, Father, that's not coming from you. So, Father, we break that today in Yeshua's name. I, I plead the blood of Christ over your precious people. Lord, you want your will done more than we do. You want to bless us more than we even want to be blessed. And you're the God of freedom. And your promises are never broken. And Father, we know that you have great plans for this nation, not because we deserve it or earned it, but because you desire to reveal yourself and you desire to and deserve to be glorified. And not only this nation, but in all the nations of the earth, you gave a promise to Abraham, Abram, and you said through you, all the nations would be blessed. And Lord Jesus, we know that this earth belongs to you. We stand on that word. Psalm 2, Abba promised it to you. This whole world is your inheritance. And Holy Spirit, you confirm that as well. And Yeshua, you are taking this earth back. The enemy has already been defeated in your cross, in your death, your resurrection. You did everything necessary to ensure this victory. And now by your spirit, you're moving through your people. And Lord, we reject the lies of the enemy. We reject the schemes of the enemy. We're in a Hadassah moment. We know what the enemy is doing. We see it, but it has failed already. And we stand in your name and we decree and declare, Lord, that your suddenly is upon us. And Lord, all you have to do is speak it. And it is. And so, Father, we're encouraged today. We're hopeful today. We stand in Yeshua today. We receive you, Holy Spirit. And we know at the right moment, and that moment is sure to come, Lord God, you will bring that sudden freedom. And we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you today. Be blessed.